good. We're going to read more from Ephesians now, but we're back in chapter 1 now, starting at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfilment, to bring all things to unity in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined, according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, when you heard them, sorry, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Amen. Okay, just, just stand up for a second. Just turn to somebody near you and say, God wants to speak to you. <laughs> and then sit down. <laughs> And then sit down. <laughs> that was just to shake off a few cobwebs there. Um, we're going to continue in our series. That we've talk, been talking about noticing uh, God. And I, I really love that passage. Uh, we're not really going to do a Bible exposition of that passage. But I, I love that passage because in the, in the Greek, it's this overflowing sentence that's kind of like 25,000 words long. You know, it's just Paul's just going... Bleh, you know, in praise, you know, maybe you don't know bleh in praise, but you know, you, he just, it's just overflowing from him and all these words, all these big theological words. You get the sense that whoever was writing this down for Paul is going, slow down, dude, slow down, right? As, as he's writing it down in this, praise be to God for all his lavish riches. And it's kind of in that note of thanksgiving and praise I, I'd like us to, to think about a bit this morning. Okay, so can we have the a PowerPoint up? Thanks. Okay, when my barber starts to get a little too adventurous, even though I specifically said just the hair, not the beard. Okay. For those of you who don't know, um, need you ask. Um, this guy on the left is the, I, I, I forgot to write down his name, is, uh, had the longest beard in the world. You can see it sort of trailing over his shoulder and, and it goes, goes for miles sort of thing. Some people need to shave twice a day and uh, some people twice a year. Um, if your name is uh, Samson, you don't want people coming near you with razor or scissors. Um, I shaved a couple of days ago. Why did I do it again today? Because it keeps growing back. This is going to be a rather tortured metaphor here, by the way. Um, keeps growing back. If you want to maintain clean shavenness, you have to keep at it, right? It takes uh, regular uh, maintenance. If you want to grow a sense of God's closeness, you need the right tools and you need a commitment to keep doing it again and again. And so I wrote this down this week. Like barnacles on a ship's hull, or hair that has been allowed to grow, we have accreted or allowed to grow a variety of cultural norms around us. And one of those is the assumption that God is far away 
he isn't. So it's time to remove some of those barnacles and to be aware again. So what I want to do today is just to give us a couple of uh, t- tools that help us, as it were, shave. Uh, they help us get rid of, rid of um, as Jim has already been praying, the, the kind of cultural atheism that says God is absent if God exists at all. The sense that this world is all there is, materialist world um, is, is all there is. Um, and these tools, I hope, that can help us to re-enchant uh, the world again. What do I mean by re-enchant? Well, we can't go back uh, to, some, to become some kind of ancient mystics. Um, the science, science has occurred, right, over the last few thousand years, and certainly in the last few hundred years, and the Enlightenment happened. We can't reverse that way of seeing the world. That's the world we live in. That's the atmosphere we breathe. But we are called to reimagine a world in which God whispers and speaks through nature, certainly, but also through a song on the radio, through a comment someone makes, through the most ordinary things. Now, caveat to all of this is, of course, with that, we run the risk of crazy, wild subjectivism, where we're flying off on all kinds of flights of fancy and, frankly, uh, false prophecy. When we see a packet of Brazil nuts and think God is calling us to Brazil, or a Mars bar wrapper and think God is calling us to NASA or Elon Musk's lot, right? But re-enchantment does mean that as long as... Well, yeah, there's a bit of shaving going on there. Just uh, thought I'd better show that. Reenchantment does mean that as long as we are anchored in the careful reading of Scripture and, we have to add the, and to this one, and in deep fellowship, fellowship in community, sometimes we can discern the hand of God in the ordinary things or, or moments. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a 19th century Baptist preacher, very well known in Baptist circles um, worldwide and uh, a very, very conservative and fierce preacher uh, and um, had, had a large uh, church in London. He, he sp- uh, writes of a number of occasions where he had uh, things that went beyond the norm and were just unusual and, and yet God seemed to be speaking through them. I just picked uh, one at random here. He writes this, at the close of a very dark and gloomy day, he was feeling down in the dumps, I lay resting on my couch as the deeper night drew on. And though all was bright within my cozy little room, some of the external darkness seemed to have entered into my soul and obscured its spiritual vision. Vainly, I tried to see the hand which I knew held mine and guide my fog-enveloped feet. He did live in London after all. (laughs) Along a steep and slippery path of suffering. In sorrow of heart I asked, why does my Lord thus deal with his child? Why does he so often send sharp and bitter pain to visit me? Why does he permit lingering weakness to hinder the sweet service I long to render to his poor servants? These fretful questions were quickly answered and though in a strange language no interpreter was needed save the conscious whisper of my own heart. For a while, silence reigned in the little room, broken only by the crackling of an oak log burning on the hearth. Suddenly, I heard a sweet, soft sound, a little, clear, musical note, like the tender trill of a robin beneath my window. What can it be, I said to my companion, who was dozing in the firelight. Surely no bird can be singing out there at this time of year and night. We listened and again heard the faint plaintive note, so sweet, so melodious, yet mysterious enough to provoke for a moment our undistinguished wonder. Presently, my friend exclaimed, it comes from the log on the fire. And we soon ascertained that her surprised assertion was correct. The fire was letting loose the imprisoned music from the old oak's inmost heart. Perchance he had garnered up this song in the days when all went well with him, when birds twittered merrily on his branches and the soft sunlight flecked his tender leaves with gold. But he'd grown old since then and hardened, ring after ring of knotty growth, had sealed up the long-forgotten melody, 
until fierce tongues of the flames came to consume his callousness and the vehement heat of the fire wrung from him at once a song and a sacrifice. Oh, thought I, when the fire of affliction draws songs of praise from us, then indeed we are purified and our God is glorified. Perhaps some of us are like this old oak log, cold, hard, and insensible. We should give forth no melodious sounds were it not for the fire which kindles round us and releases tender notes of trust in him and cheerful compliance with his will. As I muse, the fire burned and my soul found sweet comfort in the parable so strangely set before me, singing in the fire. Yes, God helping us. If that is the only way to get harmony out of these hard, apathetic hearts, and it's a very Spurgeon thing to say at the end, let the furnace be heated seven times hotter than before. Why did I go into Scottish accent? I don't know. <laughs> now, for you and I, some of us would hear the hot air being released through a narrow gap in the log, right? Creating a whistle like a robin. But in that moment, Spurgeon, because of the way he'd been thinking, because of the moment he was in with God and the conversation he'd been having with the Lord, he discerned the voice of encouragement from God. And what would otherwise have been very ordinary became a word of encouragement from the Lord for him. Was he wrong? I don't think so. A God who comes only in the dramatic or maybe once or twice in a lifetime, I, I spoke of one of my own experiences uh, last time I spoke, is a God of the exceptional moment. We need a God, though, of everyday life, one whose love surrounds us and is closer than breath. He is not God at, like Elvis who's left the building. He's not wound up the world and left us to get on with it though our culture pumps that into us day after day. Nor is he the God of those mystics who say, God really turned up at the meeting last week and who deny the quiet, gentle God of whispers and brushes. God is strongly present even when we don't notice or acknowledge him or get a feeling or a warm fuzzy. Let's remind ourselves, why do we want to notice God? Because as we do so, transformation takes place. We become like Christ. We shall see him and, and be like him. And as we do so, others can be impacted. And we start to move in the power of the Spirit. So I've got two things today to talk about in terms of actually uh, moving in this direction. But if we say we believe in a God who is close at hand, we want to ask very practical questions. How do we move beyond belief and actually live it? What are the practical things that we can do? We're going to talk about that. First of them is, is this. Keep talking. Don't stop talking to God. Whatever stage you're at, whatever relationship you're at with God, even your silence talks to God, right? You're not talking to him and you're in a half with him and you're... Mm, that's okay too. He can interpret that as a prayer as well. That's kind of what goes on a bit in the Psalms, which is why we have so many uh, Psalms that seem to be laments and complaints. God is not pretending. The psalmist is not pretending. He's not giving up on God. He just feels like God has given up on him. And this is a bit of Spurgeon's experience in that situation. But the psalmists don't disengage. The psalmists, for example, know God is big enough to cope with any kind of rage we throw at him. He's not phased by our language. And Jesus indeed takes up the psalms again and again. And takes up the full weight of it in the darkest of moments when he's on the cross. My God, why have you forsaken me? It's from the Psalms. What about us? When we're bored, do we stop talking to God? When we're enjoying life, do we include God in the process? When we've got things to give thanks for, do we notice those things and, and give thanks for them? When we're despairing of what's going on in our family or our work or our own life, is God part of the conversation? Or when it feels like you're talking to the ceiling, or have no words left, do you keep going? Even in silence, because silence can be a prayer. See, our implicit theology is more significant than our stated uh, theology. 
What we actually do is more important than what we say we believe. James basically says that. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. So we are called to be those who believe in a God close at hand is what we're saying in this whole series. We must not just state it, but learn to live it. And the first way I'd say is to keep talking. The second way I'll come to in a minute, but I just want us to watch a, a short video uh, just now. Uh, this is uh, just to int introduce this video. Um, this is a professor of psychology, uh, I think it's at Yale University, and, and reflecting on uh, how we can be happy and what that looks like to be happy. And it reflects a little bit of what we're talking about today. Thank you. The real way to thwart our biases is to behave differently. There's a whole set of practices I like to call rewirements. All of us can engage with rewiring our own habits in order to change our behaviors and feel better. When we think about the behaviors that we need to change as part of our rewirements, there's one big one that comes up initially, social connection. Every available study of happy people suggests that happy people are more social. They physically spend time around other people and they tend to really prioritize time with their friends and family members. Our lack of social connection really comes from the fact that we have this strong intuition that it kind of doesn't matter. There's lots of work by Nick Epley for a bias that's known as under-sociality. We just systematically misestimate how good social connection will feel. Instead of scrolling through social media, use your phone to actually be a phone and call someone that you care about. These simple acts of connecting in real life, ideally, but especially in real time, can significantly improve well-being. Another behavior that we know really affects our happiness is doing nice things for other people, trying to become a little bit more other-oriented. This is a spot where we have seriously incorrect intuitions. We often think that self-care is the path to happiness, but the evidence really suggests that happy people are much more other-oriented. They're donating more money to charity. They're spending their time volunteering for others. They give more compliments. Another way that we can rewire our happiness is to change our thought patterns. Do we have a mindset of paying attention to all the negative things, all the hassles in life, or do we have a mindset that focuses more on the blessings? Lots of evidence suggests that happy people focus on the blessings. If you tend not to do that naturally, you can change that thought pattern. One fantastic way to do this is simply to just write down three to five things you're grateful for every night. And this practice can improve your well being in as little as two weeks. Another thought pattern that we can engage to feel happier is paying attention to the good stuff in life. One of the reasons our good circumstances don't necessarily lead to happiness is we tend not to notice them. We'll buy a delicious latte that we should be paying attention to and savoring and really enjoying, but we just kind of chug it while we're checking our email. The act of savoring is moving towards paying attention to the good things in life a little bit more. A final way we can rewire our behavior is to make changes in our body. We often forget that bodies are connected to minds, but they really are. And that means that a really quick way to change how we're feeling emotionally is simply moving our body a little bit more. Exercise is intricately connected to our mental health. And it's important to know that this isn't like running a marathon. This is simply just getting your body to move around a little bit more. Even as much as like 20 minutes a day can really improve your well-being. These so-called rewirements, they're really useful for moving from not feeling so good at the time to flourishing a little bit more. This is not necessarily the tools that you might use if you're facing a really serious mental disorder. Sometimes people think like, oh, I'm suicidally ideating, I should do a gratitude list or so. It's like, no, 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 that's an acute emergency and you should really get a special, more acute kind of care. You should see a psychotherapist. Rewirements are just yet another tool in the toolkit that we can all use to be improving our own well-being. We're going to have moments of anger. We're gonna have moments of sadness. We're gonna have moments of fear or frustration or overwhelm. That's part of being human. Our negative emotions are signals that are telling us something really important. Our sadness is there to tell us, hey, you're missing something in life. You might need to make changes. You might need to reach out to a friend. Negative emotions are normative in certain circumstances, so we shouldn't try to wish them away. We just need to be able to regulate them in positive ways. The key, though, is that you have to put these strategies into practice. You can't just learn about them. It turns out that knowing from a cognitive science perspective, it's not half the battle. The real work is putting the things you learn into practice. When we understand the right things to do and put those things into practice, we really can significantly change our levels of happiness. So we're gonna do some exercise just now, okay? You see me with the red pants there doing the... <laughs> um, so 
keep talking, and so there's, there's only two parts of this message, so it's not very about this message. Um, ex- secondly, exercise the belief daily and throughout the day. It's interesting to me watching that video again and just being struck that even within cognitive science, they reflect on gratitude as one of the most important things for human happiness. Uh, Michael Caine was, a- was asked whether he believed in God years ago. And if I remember it exactly, uh, it's, he, he responded by saying, well, no, but I, every day I wake up, I'm grateful. I'm just grateful for life, for, for whatever it is I have in life. And um, I was really struck by that, that it's kind of a grateful to whom? <laughs> Gratitude requires an object. And yet there's a deeply intuitive sense of, of wonder that, that, uh, that, that is there in human, very DNA of human beings. Anyway, there are a myriad of ways to, to exercise uh, a belief of gratitude and, and, and some of these practices that, that she talked about there, but let's take one approach that uh, came, from, uh, came from the church. Now, caveat here, I'm, I'm a rank amateur at this, so I, I, I share this as a, a fellow journeyer. And this is a guy called Ignatius of Loyola who invented uh, this thing called the examen, which was part of the spiritual exercises. And the idea is of an ongoing encounter with the presence of God. And at the heart of the examen is the principle of finding God in all things. I know, I know there's one or two people who, who, who use, use the examen um, um, from time to time. Uh, work, family, politics, illness, money, sexuality, friendship, culture, you name it, God is there. Now, Ignatius was a bit of a troublemaker. Um, he was around 450 years ago, uh, a gambler, a jeweler, sleeping around, but he came to know Jesus and developed the prayer of examine. I think it's, it's actually uh, really, really helpful as a, a habit to get into and to, to nurture and to develop throughout your day. Now, there are some sheets at the back um, with this on. So if you wanted to take that away with you, that you can do. Um, I'd also, if for those of you who are running small groups, I'd really, really uh, commend this to you as a way to do a small group and, and, and develop uh, one of the habits. If you're coming to the end of one of the series and you wanted to break it up for a couple of weeks, do the examine for a couple of weeks in a row. Uh, and just it, it enables sharing, it enables encouragement, enables us to see uh, beyond our, our self-absorbed uh, lives. So this is, how, this is roughly, this is one version of it. There's a few versions of it you can uh, look at, but this is one version which I found helpful. Firstly is the, the stage of, of gratitude, and we did a little bit of that earlier. What are the good gifts that God has given you today or this week? Um, maybe you've had good news, maybe it's been a beautiful day, maybe you've had a fun time, maybe something really positive has happened. What are you grateful for? And, and it takes a moment, if you've got a memory like a sieve like I have, to recall things, right? God help me as I get older, <laughs> I really, I'm terrible now at remembering things. Um, but recall, recall it, remember it. Revisit it, go there in your mind. Again, remember the feelings, the experience. That fish sauce I mentioned earlier, when I shared that, I said that to Sue, I, I, was, I, I was, I can almost taste it now. It was an existential moment down there in the peninsula. And it was just a beautiful, it genuinely was a, a, a kind of a God thing for me. I relished it, I experienced the feelings again. Even on a bad day, uh, caveat if you're, Clinically depressed, perhaps not, but even on a bad day, this is something we can do. As we habituate this kind of prayer into our lives, we start to become grateful people. Now, some of you are naturally positive, and some of you are naturally Eeyores. Um, Eeyore is a psychotherapy term invented by A.A. Milne, which beautifully describes my core DNA at times. Um, so it is about learning to become a grateful person. The more you give thanks, the more you become a grateful person. 
and you become from that a gift to others. What do we love? What do we love about Neville Kellum? Apart from everything, it's always so positive, right? And he infects us with his energy. Same with Miriam. Now we don't, you know, we're not saying you need to become like them, but you need to become the you version, right? Of someone who is grateful. All life is a gift uh, from God. So let's notice his gifts to us. Uh, Second thing is to be aware, become aware of God's presence. Now this takes some work when we're not good at it because as I say, we're breathing in, God's not around, he's left the building. Look for the presence of God in the last 24 hours in your life. Not his gifts, but his presence. How do we do that? I think we do it by certainly identifying our feelings, our experiences throughout the day, our thoughts. Where was God's fruit in in this way of thinking? Where was love and joy and peace and kindness? What little bits and pieces made me smile or made me happy? What little bits made me sad or stressed or confused? And ask, well, how, how was God with me even in those harder times, those confusing, those stressed times? At first, I think, and I'm still learning, this is, is difficult. We're not used to doing this, to noticing. And it kind of starts as a kind of thinking exercise. But I think it becomes more intuitive as time goes on. So when we're sad, for example, our instinct is less to say, I'm on my own here. And more, this is painful, but God is in the midst of my pain. Something like that. And sometimes it is very hard to find God. We may may be reduced to saying, I know you were there, but I don't know where God. That's okay too. So one of the ways to work with this, and I'll probably give some notes out this week because uh, I think uh, you're, you're trying to process things that, I, that re- require some work, is to, is to write down some of your feelings and situations in the last 24 hours. Write down how God's presence was known or if that's really too difficult, where it might be at work. Say a prayer of thanks for God's presence in each of those situations. Now all habits are a bit like carrying a, buck, a bucket of water to to that's got holes in it right you go and fill up the the water the bucket and it's leaking everywhere and and you only get a little bit at the end of it from for what you wanted it for but sometimes that's okay because on the way you've watered the plants on the way right how far can i push that analogy then there's confession And you come to this last because it's grace that comes to us first. And it's noticing the presence, the goodness, the greatness, the kindness, the love of God. And there are two kinds of of confession. One is omission and one is commission, failing to do what's right and doing what's wrong. And And so some of that requires owning the failure, coming to Jesus, pausing, Then moving on. Don't rush that. And the first two exercises show us God's gifts and God's presence. And that's the God we come to, giving and present. So it makes confession a little less like begging for mercy from a tyrant. And more like saying sorry to a deeply loving parent. Now, this is a useful tool not to read as you drive, but to think about as you drive. Remember as you go the previous day perhaps, do a review as you're driving. Do it from the viewpoint of gratitude, gratitude to God for the concrete gifts of life and for his presence. And sometimes noticing is a subtle thing. Noticing the love within a conversation. The joy that needs to be articulated to be filled up more. If I have a meme to share, um. I I, I want to share it. If I have a joke to share, I want to share it. Because in the sharing, in the articulating, it it makes it all the funnier to me, right? C.S. Lewis said something similar about praise. The completion is, is in the sharing. My family on our 
chat group have banned me from sharing Lord of the Rings memes. Of course, because it's me. But apart from that, to start looking for those joyous things. Maybe someone in your family has rubbed you up the wrong way and you've reacted. If you practice the prayer of examine, it can cause you to review the day and review the incident in a slightly more open frame of mind. We reframe the incident from who is right or wrong to looking for love. It's challenging, and it's certainly challenging if you're a bit of a grumpy guts or a warrior, but the examine helps us do it better. There is sheets at the back if you like to take those details away with you, and I'll, I'll try and send some more stuff out this week about it um, in that respect. So these are just all part of this uh, journey of noticing God, just more tools f that we might want to use. That is one of the most respected tools, I think, in the church um, uh, uh, around, and it's, it's certainly been the habit of many for centuries uh, to, to make these things part of their, their routine. And it might be worthwhile doing uh, for you as a small group to, to tr try that too. So I, I commend that highly to you. Let's pray. Lord, we would want to be those who in the words of Jesus are makarios, blessed, happy, as the woman talked about. We want to be those who are blessed by the presence of the Spirit of God in every moment of our lives and are aware of that blessing. We want to be those who are transformed by that awareness, by that reality. So open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, that we might see your wondrous, close presence to us. In Jesus' name, amen. If like me, creation is, is one of my favorite places um, to discover.